don't care how long ago last night's game was, that was fun. I know, I had fun watching it too. You know, you don't have to social distance from me, we live together. True, but what if I just don't like you? Hi, kids! Victorious puppies! Huh? This team is ruining my life! Why do I want hockey? Stress relief, hopefully! We can, oh, and oh, we will. Oh, 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 oh. Victory puppies, boys, from a game that's 27 years old! Game winner, Wendell Bark! Yeah! Leafs win! 4-2 to two over the Detroit Red Wings in Game 3 of the 1993 Norris Division Semi-Final. What is the Norris Division? I don't even remember. All I know is that it was Game 3 and the Leafs won, and they needed it. And as long as we're talking about things that we could use, did you know that the tax deadline was extended to June 1st? We've got more than enough to be worried about these days, and tax season does not have to be one of them. TurboTax Live is here to help. With TurboTax Live, you can rest assured that you'll be getting support from qualified experts and all from the comfort of your own home. It's wonderful, and the video technology aspect of it is fantastic. It's like if I were there right with you helping you with your taxes, except instead of me, it's a qualified expert and they're not screaming. And with all the time and stress that you save, you don't have to scream either. It's better that way. Trust me. Now, let's talk about the game, shall we? Or rather, let's talk about the series so far, because this is game three. Because I thought about it. You know, Sportsnet is airing the entire 1993 series of the Leafs and Red Wings, and I was like, I'm going to do a video for every game. And then I saw the Leafs lost 6-3 in game one and 6-2 in game two. And because there's no new games on, I can make videos about whatever I want, and I figured I've covered enough Leaf losses over the years. Why don't I just do the games that I want to do, like the ones that they win? And I decided to start with game three. Right away, watching the old school broadcast, the old school graphics, the, the, the visual of Maple Leaf Garden, and it's not a Loblaws. For those of you that don't know, Maple Leaf Garden is obviously no longer the home of the Toronto Maple Leafs at Scotiabank Arena, but Maple Leaf Garden is now half a athletic facility for the local university, Ryerson University, and half a grocery store. There's a spot in like the middle of one of the aisles indicating where center ice is, or was. And the second I see the graphic with Felix Potvin on it, I'm just like, yeah, I'm a child again, except I have beer, this is amazing! And all of that brought the nostalgia back, obviously, but what really did it for me were the sounds. And at the forefront of all that, Bob Cole and Harry Neal in the broadcast booth. Now, it doesn't matter the age. Anyone watching this got to watch Bob Cole or listen to Bob Cole call games because he only stopped a year ago. But this was Bob three decades ago. There's just a little bit more pace, a little bit more energy. But still never ever needing to take over. Bob Cole never had to be the star of the show. He know when to play the sounds of the game like an orchestra. And Harry Neal in color commentary, I, I forgot how good he was. I forgot how completely I, I don't think Harry Neal would be accepted in the broadcast booth today. There was none of this wishy-washy, well, I don't know about that. Well, I think there was none of that. There was none of that thinking about what people are going to say on social media if I criticize William Nylander. Harry Neal said what he said, and if you got a problem with it, what are you going to do? Write me a letter? Shut up, I'm Harry Neal. There was a play in this game where he called Wendell Clark, the captain of the Toronto Maple Leafs, beloved captain of the Toronto Maple Leafs, tough, hard-nosed captain of the Toronto Maple Leafs, wasn't one of these finesse players afraid to go into the corners. He called a play that Wendell Clark did selfish. And what it was is Wendell Clark got a double minor for roughing. He punched Vladimir Konstantinov in the face for no reason, and then he started to get into a scrap that he was frankly lucky was only called two minutes for roughing, and an offsetting roughing, which, meh. Actually, watching the broadcast, the two guys I thought Bob and especially Harry Neal were hardest on were Wendell Clark and Doug Gilmore. That's a selfish penalty. That pass wasn't smart. Like, he wasn't afraid at all. We look at older hockey like it was barbaric, and it was, and we'll get to that. But we also look at it like just all violence was just praised all the time. Just, oh, you can't let him do that. No, if you took a penalty that put your team down while you had the lead in a playoff game on home ice in a series in which you were losing two to nothing, Harry Neal called it out. But that was much later in the game. At the beginning of the game, it was the Leafs down two to nothing in the series, but drawing the first penalty of the game. The Leafs not able to convert on the power play, but they are all over the Red Wings in the first five minutes. Dave Anderchuk flying right down the middle of the ice. Oh, he can't put it in. Puck is in the corner. Mike Foligno digging away. You're not going to get that away from him. He fights to get the puck out of the corner. Doesn't get the scoring chance himself, but Dave Anderchuk bangs it in his first of the playoffs, and the Leafs get their first lead of the series up 1-0. Dave Anderchuk was unbelievable for the Leafs that season. They got him in a trip 
trade with the Buffalo Sabres and heading into that trade, Ander Chuck had 29 goals and 61 points in 52 games. After that trade, as a member of the Toronto Maple Leafs, 25 goals and 38 points in just 31 games games. On the broadcast, Harry Neal called Andrew Chuck one of the best garbage men in the league, and he wasn't wrong at all. That was his home, just banging pucks in right from the crease. There are certain milestones in sports that you have to hit to get into the Hall of Fame. In baseball, they usually say 3,000 hits is an automatic in. Hockey doesn't officially have one. A lot of people think that the milestone is 500 goals. It's 600. Every single player who has ever scored 600 goals in the National Hockey League is in the Hockey Hall of Fame, with two exceptions. Yarmir Yager and Jerome McGinley, and that's just they'll get in one day. We know that. But for the longest time, for over a decade, Dave Anderchuk waited to get into the Hockey Hall of Fame despite scoring over 600 goals. Now, I'm not old enough to talk about Dave Anderchuk's prime vividly. I just don't remember it. And a lot of people go, well, it was the longevity that helped get him in. I mean, he won the cup like a, uh, over a decade after this with the Lightning. Kind of feels like that should count for something. But for the longest time, he was the only guy with 600 plus goals to not be in the Hall of Fame. And it felt wrong. So when he finally got in, it felt like a correction. So the Leafs, finally, they have the lead in the series. They have all the momentum let's go a Red Wings fan threw an octopus on the ice at Maple Leaf Garden but it wasn't this whole wow everybody wow there's an octopus on the ice they just kind of cleaned it up and got on with the game like right away it barely slowed anything down it was 1993 they probably gave it back to the guy like you knocked that malarkey off 1993 or 23 I don't know what I was doing an impression of there <laughs> only a few minutes later still in the first 10 minutes of the game still in the first eight minutes of the game Doug Gilmore methodical flying in against the Red Wings one on four realizes he has absolutely nothing and his team is changing, so he kind of goes back a little bit. And then a bat out of hell again! Into the Red Wing zone with the puck! Gets it to Dave Anderchuk again! Score! When he gets the first one, he's the trash man! When he gets the second one, it's called recycling! His second of the game makes it 2 nothing Leafs early on. And the Leafs get another power play. The Red Wings are falling apart. Let's go! They're gonna go up 3 no Ah! Red Wings get a break, but a huge stop by Pop Van. Oh my god. His best save of the game so far and saving the Leafs from themselves, saving the Leafs from embarrassment because that would mean they have allowed shorthanded goals in three straight playoff games. The Leafs consistently allowing scoring chances while on the power play. Is this from 1993 or just a blurry game from a month and a half ago? Now if I was a Red Wings fan I would be losing my mind because I don't understand how they called a penalty back in 1993. They showed one penalty and it was a very interesting breakdown. A player got like a hard hook in the hands, which we know today you can't do that. Two minutes for you can't do that. And then there was another one like around the ribs and again like it's close to spearing, you can't do that. They don't call it, but then the stick gets up in the face. Oh uh, no. So how the heck did they call a penalty back in 1993? I noticed a couple things. One, it seemed like almost every player got a warning. Hey, you knock it off and then they call it. Or you commit two or three infractions and they call the third one. Hook, hey. Hook, hey, high stick, all right! Or the other thing that very hasn't changed, I think this was a Steve Eisenman penalty later in the game, it affected possession. And Harry Neal, once again, an excellent breakdown. I think it was Peter Zezel had the puck. Leafs are on the penalty kill, they're about to ice it. Steve Eisenman takes him down. Leafs ice the puck there, that's a key play on the penalty kill, and Eisenman prevented it. If that wasn't a factor in there, Honestly, he probably gets away with it, but because it affected possession, get in the box. And speaking of Steve Eisenman, it is unbelievable how good he was, how much better than everyone else he was, how fast he was back then. And the first goal scorer of that game, Sergei Fedorov, Nick Lidstrom was also on that squad. They had the makings of something really special. Start of the second period, Detroit Red Wings on the power play from a Todd Gill holding call from the end of the first period. Paul Coffey cross crease to Sergei Fedorov. Oof, Maron, that's an amazing goal. Silky and the sort of thing that makes you feel like, mm -mm, they might tie this thing. 2-1. Little over 13 minutes into the second period, it's that penalty that I was talking about. Wendell Clark clocking Vladimir Konstantinov for poking at Felix Potvin a little bit, and then 
half fighting Keith Primo. Rewatching it, I'm sort of caught between what Harry Neal said, where, yeah, it was kind of a selfish penalty, and also the Red Wings were poking and prodding at Pot Van all night. And it's funny because a lot of time has passed, and I've played in charity hockey games with Wayne Primo, Keith's brother, but the child in me saw Keith Primo attacking a Leaf goalie, and I was like, get him, Wendell! Keith was the king of that, and it looks like he did it for a very long time. I remember him doing this with the Philadelphia Flyers, just on Ed Belfour, like, Oh no! I've fallen! There's nothing I could have done! Oh my gosh, look at me doing this by accident! People talk about flopping to draw penalties. Keith Primo used to flop to avoid them. He was the king of just falling on your goalie and being like, uh-oh! And it's bad enough that Felix Pavet has to worry about people poking and prodding him and crashing into him when just before this fight, Bob Probert took a slap shot shattered the glass behind him. Which is kind of terrifying because we talk about goalies from the 90s having all that, that huge equipment and the huge pads. Not in the early 90s, man. You might have had the big pads or glove or blocker. Your chest protection was a bib made of felt. And the Leafs start getting into penalty trouble and Puffin's like sitting on his bum and he's making giant saves all over the place. Oh, it was so easy to fall in love with goalies in the 90s, man. This whole quarantine has screwed up the, the old hockey thing, like what people refer to as old hockey. For me, it's not the 90s, obviously. I grew up in the 90s. Old hockey for me is the stuff I don't even remember. I only saw like highlights of the 80s. Old, old hockey is the 70s, 60s, 50s, 40s, all that. But even as recently, as recent for 1993 standards, as recently as the 80s, all you had to do was shoot the puck along the ice, man. They don't know what the butterfly is. They're never going to leave their skates. It's the least athletic guy on the team banging along the ice. But now it's the 90s. They can go on their knees for a big chunk of the game and not worried about their equipment getting waterlogged. They can actually push. They have leg strength. They have flexibility. The other team's banging and crashing, and if they're not doing it, your own guys are going to hit guys into you. Opposing forwards using their stick like they're defending the hot gates from Xerxes. For me, during in my childhood, the goalies were some of the biggest warriors on the ice. I cheered for the Toronto Maple Leafs, and Felix Potvin was the goalie for most of my childhood. Speak ill of him again, and you will catch these hands. Felix Potvin holds the fort. We head to the third period. Now it is the Leafs with the power play, and after putting the Leafs into penalty trouble, it is Wendell Clark getting them out of it. Clark, all alone in front. The captain? How dare you? Doug Gilmore picking up his third assist of the game. Wendell Clark banging it home. 3-1. Nine and a half minutes in. Wendell Clark setting up Rob Pearson this time. Wendell Clark is the one setting it up. And Pearson scores. 4-1. The best lead to have in the third period if you're the Toronto Maple Leafs. Used to be. And you notice the game get a little tighter, get a little slower, get a little bit more physical. And right as Harry Neal is like, well... The Leafs game plan is pretty obvious. They're gonna try to stay close with the Red Wings. They score. Steve Chase on flying in with speed that I didn't know you could have back then. From Sergei Fedorov and Vladimir Konstantinov, the Red Wings look pumped, and oh my goodness, are they seriously gonna do this? Sylvia and Lefebvre puts the Leafs down on the penalty kill. Are they seriously gonna do this? But Steve Eiserman takes that penalty on Peter Zezel that I mentioned earlier in the video. The Leafs lock her down from then on and take game three. Dave Anderchuk, two goals. Doug Gilmore, three assists, but for crying out loud, Felix Potvin stopping 34 of 36, recovering from allowing six goals in two consecutive games to be the hero for the Leafs in game three on home ice. And now, questions. Is Felix Potvin as good as childhood Steven remembered him? I'll let Joe Pack answer this one. How rude. Well, actually, it's interesting, because this Felix Potvin, like, I, I don't remember. I was too young. I was five. I, I remember the Leafs winning my first Leafs game. I think I was five or was I six? I was five or six. And I remember being at the game. And it was against the Red Wings. It just wasn't in the playoffs. I remember being at the game. I don't remember anything that happened. I remember watching the Leafs and Kings this year. I don't remember anything that happened. What's funny is the Podvan I really remember, I, I remember mid-90s Podvan, but also late-90s Podvan when the Leafs were garbage and he had to be their best player every single night because they were going to get shelled. And everyone talks about like, oh, the jersey tuck, oh, the flow. Felix Podvan had more style than any player in the National Hockey League in the 90s. Get out of here. The mask, the pads, the gloves. Dirty. Hey Steve, not so much a question as a statement. Nova Scotia loves you. It's been amazing to see the outpouring of support from everywhere. We'll all get through this 
and come back stronger and ready to party at the lower deck, hell yes, when the virus also leaves. Thank you, Joey Halifax. Well, that is a... Uh, that's a tough one. We haven't really talked about it on the podcast, um, what happened in Nova Scotia. I just, I don't know what else to say other than it's the worst thing imaginable. And I know East Coasters sort of hate being all lumped together because it's like, ah, oh, St. John's, Halifax, I've been to those places. And you're like, that's not the same. But the people in Nova Scotia are some of the best I've ever met. And if there's anyone I would expect to come out of this strong, It'd be you. And why would we end on a positive note? Let's go to Andrew Berkshire, that ray of sunshine. Is it weird to watch the Leafs in the playoffs and not have the nagging feeling that they're gonna blow it? This is what I was talking about when Kawhi hit the buzzer beater against the Philadelphia 76ers. I thought to myself, I, I want to get that picture. I want to blow that up. I want to get that in the basement. I, I want to get it painted on the walls. Forget getting the picture. I want it painted on the walls like the Sistine Chapel. But I thought to myself, it won't be the same if they don't win. And they're down 2 nothing against the Bucks. I'm like, uh, I don't know if I'm getting that picture. And they beat the Bucks. But oh, they got the Golden State Warriors. I don't know if I'm going to get that picture. And then when they beat them, I'm like, okay, I'm getting the picture. And I don't care what you say, you silly meanie. I'm going to leave some blank space on the wall for the Leafs just in case. So that is it for this one. Thank you very much for watching. Click like if you like this video. Click subscribe if you really liked it. Tell all your friends that we got a brand new Pinnacle Pizza Steve Dangle podcast coming tonight and also on Sportsnet's Twitch channel. What? They have one of those? Yeah, they just made it. I'm going to be broadcasting tonight, I think from 7 to 9, twitch.tv slash sportsnetca. Oh, baby.